starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Heat Recovery Project, Heat of Compression Desiccant Dryers. This webinar is brought to you by Compressed Air Best Practices Magazine. This webinar is sponsored by Henderson Engineering Company. Our keynote speaker is Hank Van Ormer from Air Power USA, and our sponsor speaker is Chuck Henderson from Henderson Engineering Company. My name is Claire Heinel, and I am the Circulation and Events Manager for Compressed Air Best Practices Magazine. I will be troubleshooting the webinar and moderating the Q&A session, so please bear with me while I go over a few logistics. One of our most frequently asked questions is for access to the presentation slides and the recording. Both will be available following the webinar. A link to the recording and slides will be made available to attendees via email later today. PDH certificates will be emailed to attendees within two days. I'd also like to quickly go over our Q&A format, which will take place at the end of the session. Please use your question window to submit questions and direct them to Compressed Air Best Practices Magazine. If we do not get to your question during the allotted time, we will follow up personally with an email. We also have handouts available for all attendees. Handouts include brochures provided by Henderson Engineering Company and Air Power USA. Henderson Engineering Company has also provided a video that featured them on manufacturing marvels on the Fox Business Network. Handouts also include our brochure with details for the 2019 Best Practices Expo and Conference in Nashville scheduled October 13th through the 16th. This next slide is a disclaimer. The basic message is each system is unique and you need to consult with system specialists to come up with your own specifications. Smith & Nania Communications does not assume and hereby disclaims any liability to any person or company for any loss or damage caused by errors or omissions in the materials of this webinar. We will do our best to keep this webinar to an hour long session. Feel free to reach out to us afterwards if you have any questions. Before we begin the presentations, I would like to make you all aware of our 2019 Best Practices Expo and Conference happening October 13th through the 16th at the Music City Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Please consider allocating some time to attend our show. The focus of the show is optimizing on-site utilities powering automation. At the end of the webinar, we are having a contest for a chance to win a free full conference pass valued at $675. This will take place after the Q&A session and is open to those who have a direct impact on energy savings in a factory. And this includes factory personnel, compressed air distributors, utility incentive programs, and engineering firms. The goal of today's session is to learn how heat of compression desiccant dryers operate and can be your next excellent heat recovery project. This webinar will discuss the amount of heat available for heat recovery projects in industrial air compressors. Our keynote speaker is Mr. Hank Van Ormer. Mr. Van Ormer is the Technical Director of Air Power USA. He has over 50 years of experience in the compressed air and gas industry. Take it away, Hank. Uh, there's been a lot of information put out by us and other people on HOC dryer technology over the last couple of years. In doing follow-up with, <coughs> excuse me, with the customers and people that listen to it, we found they're still somewhat confused about heat compression. And one of the some of the confusion is like, what is it? Is it a phenomenon, or what is it? Where does it come from, and why is it considered free? So we're going to try to address that in, in this uh, in this webinar. And so HOC heat of compression it's not a phenomena. It's a technical. It, technically, it is the heat. It's a reflection of the inefficiency of the compression process. So in the case of compressed air, we put in eight horsepower worth of energy, and it creates about one horsepower worth of work at 100 pound pressure. 
So you got seven horsepower worth of energy that you put into the process did not get taken out as work. So going that means that any any energy you put into the process that didn't come out as work has to come out as something that energy can't be created nor destroyed. So that so the that seven horsepower, well let's put it this way. The 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 uh one horsepower that you got to do work is 2546 BTUs per hour, 2546. The seven horsepower that you didn't get any work is 17,820 some BTUs per hour. So there it is. It's it's in your cooling system. It's in your air system. It's in your water system. And you can if you can tap that, obviously you're going to be able to. If you can use that, get that, and you make it do something for you, or replace something else, heat something, you, it's free because you've already paid for it when you got the compressed air. That's why it's free. It's not free, but you already paid for it. So if you don't use it, it's gone. So where does it come from? What's this technical? I said energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Do you remember high school physics? I tell you, for me to remember high school physics, I got to have a long-term clear memory because that was a long time ago. However, that was it. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So when you make, when you do something with it, if you if you put energy into the into the process of compression and don't take it out with work, equal amount of work, then that means you've got some leftover energy, and when it comes out, it's heat. Now. That's 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 the and it happens in it doesn't have to be compressed air. It can be any compressed gas. It can be it's hydraulics. If you have a hydraulic pump and it's bypassing all the time, the problem is you generate heat. If you don't have enough cooling capacity in the system, then it gets too hot. That's what's that's the same stuff. So you put work into a fluid, didn't do any work, so now it's now it's showing up as, as spun off heat. So recovered heat will allow the, the plant to use some other heat source and the opportunity to reduce total plant operating costs. Now, uh, so what's what is the recoverable heat of compression? Well, as I said here er, real quick there earlier, it's it's the, the potential energy recovery is 85 to 90 percent of the total motor horsepower in the form of heated cooling air or water. Uh, in, in the case of water, it's maybe up to 130 degrees temperature. In the case of air, it's going to be somewhere between 5 to 20 degrees above ambient. And from a rotated, from a lubricant cooled rotary screw or rotary type compressor, probably be somewhere 150 to 190 degrees if you can catch it there. So these are all things you can use. And these are, this is not, the, every one of these processes and all these numbers I'm going to show you. Are, are, are kind of nominal numbers because it's very site specific. Like I, I could have one system generating lots of heated compression, but if you lose it through poor insulation or something, you're not going to get the same numbers. But so what we work with uh, is what's the maximum potential, and we'll get into that. Now the air compressors, in the case of air, which is what we're talking about, can be lubricated or non-lubricated. And there are people who say, well, you can't use heated compression unless it's non-lubricated. That's that's not really true. You can't use, you generally don't use, and, and probably never really going to want it, you never should use a a lubricated compressor to run a, a, a heated compression dryer. However, if you just want a dinner, you're going to get the same amount of heat, whether it's lubricated or not lubricated. And if all you're doing is using the maybe Maybe heat something at point of use on another process doesn't matter unless it's something matter. I mean, so so we'll get into that too. Why why what why the dryer has is sensitive, but so there are good projects for recoverable energy that can require non-move air, and there are just lots of projects for recoverable heat that can be uh, lubricated air. So the the potential value. Really depends on. Yeah, try to remind you. See, on this, what happened to that chart? We have a little. 
the computer's in rebellion. There, there we go. This chart kind of shows you some numbers, and these are uh, generally accepted numbers of the potential recoverable energy based on the amount of cubic feet of air, air cooled or water cooled. And they're, they're, it's, it's not saying they, it doesn't matter because of it, how much you read. Now, how much you recover of this may depend if it's air cooled or water cooled. But when we talk about maximum potential recovery, so if I, you take uh, 2,500 CFM, which is around 600 horsepower, 550, 600 horsepower, you see that you've got a million 543 BTUs per hour. And if you go to water cooled, you've got the same number because the number doesn't change because it's the amount of air I compress and the amount of heated compression I got from that air. And, then, and these numbers have been now are starting to include probable losses. So are they are they the accurate? Well, already they're not accurate because I use the word probable. So, and, but this is what if you're in an industry in, in the in our industry, <clears throat> excuse me, this is what you would look at, and you would say this is a pretty good number. We start here. So, how, how does this work? Probable losses. You could, if you take 1,500, 1,543,000 BTUs per hour at 450, that'd be about 452 kW, around 600 horsepower, maximum, maximum potential recovery, recoverable. It doesn't matter whether it's water or air cooled. However, water cooled machines tend to run a little cooler, air cooled machines tend to run a little hotter. And it's a little easier to recover the heat from a stream of water that's control flow versus depending on how your air cools or how cool this air cool is set up. And if we recover this heat, how do we convert the BTUs per hour to electric cost? Well, here's, a, here's an example, uh, things you have to know. Uh, what's, what's, what's your amount of air, air that you're working with? System size. In this case, we just hit 2,500 CFM at 100 pounds. Operating hours, 6,240 a year. Blended electric costs per kWh. We're using seven cents. That, that what that says is, you take all your electric bill, divide it by your total kWh, and now you got cents per kWh, and uh, it, it, it includes bonuses and penalties and whatever. And that would be your average electric cost. One kWh is third three thousand four hundred and fourteen BTUs per hour. That's a constant number. So the probable recoverable, or probable recovered BTUs per hour at seventy five percent efficiency. And that's a now. Are they all seventy five? No. What it's saying is, when you put together a pretty decent system of recovering, you're probably going to lose twenty five percent. If you put it not so good, it maybe loses more. So a million five two seven two fifty BTUs per hour divided by thirty four fourteen is three thirty nine. And if you take three thirty nine kW, which is one hundred and forty eight thousand dollars a year, every compressed air system has excess heat of compression, and it's recoverable. Look for the places in the plant where it can be utilized because it's already paid for. So now let's just take that. If you want to take that 75% that I use, you just take 25% off that number. Uh, now here's the, here's a typical other energy opportunity. It doesn't have to be from an oil-free or a non-lubricated compressor. Many successful applications can be implemented with lubricated machines, particularly such as heating specific areas with the dedicated heat exchanger. Now, what you see here is an air-cooled machine, rotary screw compressor. The cooling, cooling air is coming up a duct. It's controlled. It goes, it's being taken to other departments to either heat the department or put up barriers so you, to keep the heat in a room or out of a room. But it's, it's an airflow system. So you have to keep it insulated. You have to keep it flowing. And, you, and we use booster fans to keep it moving if required. When you do this, you kind of 
get it. If you do this, there's a rotary screw compressor, or whatever, or a scroll, or whatever, or a vein, or whatever it is. There's a cooler between that duct and that box. You got to be sure that you're allowing that you're not restricting that airflow. So when you do this, if you don't have all the numbers, get with the manufacturer. What's the amount of back pressure he can handle? Mo most of these, uh, most of the machines are somewhere between a half inch of water and a quarter inch of water. Back pressure. The system layout illustrated on the next slide coming up shows a 2,500, two, two 250 horsepower rotary screw compressors with a 2,500 SCFM sized water cooled refrigerated air dryer. The expected and calculated, going through the math just like we did earlier, is $190,000. That's say if you got everything dead right, you got $190,000 recovery. I wouldn't spend it because it doesn't usually come out that good. So it's annually based on, re, on the re, heating, the river water, process water. And this is from an actual job in a, in a pet food plant from average temperature of 60 degrees to 94. This takes the energy load off the current electric heater system. So the, in the, because of the varied, varied heat and flow efficiency, the goal was not met. The goal number of 190 was not met over a five year period. The total annual savings for this project measured $128,000. Most, it, it, it was it was lower. Okay, so you got 128, you didn't get your 190. The pre-cooling effect of the of the heat reclamation loop on a 10 fan unit made it much more efficient cooling. And so what happens is you undershot what your baseline was. It never took a hundred, never, never, it never cost as much as it was calculated to cost looking at it. Now, this was done about 20 years ago, so we, we knew a little less. I don't know, I, I knew a little less, and I probably forgotten something too since then. So, if we had five years of operation, and then we went to some measured checks, and the measured checks we reestablished a, a, a baseline, and this is what comes up you have a typical Total recoverable same BTU as per hour potential. Potential energy savings still 448. However, it, it all ultimately came out to about 120,000 actual. So not a bad number considering that there was no cost in it other than the, the cost of putting in the little uh, reclamation loop was about $7,000 for, uh, for the heat exchanger and if I remember right, somewhere in about 8,000 for the, for the piping and stuff. And the, the pump was already there. So that's not a bad deal, 120,000 a year. Now, there's another thing in, called reheating. The, the reheaters, this is often done with lubricated machines, uh, where you take, you, you, you take the heat, you, you, let's say you do it in a rotary screw compressor. So your, your hot oil comes out, the air comes out, goes, it comes to the after cooler at, at 170 degrees, and then it comes out less than 100, and then it goes back, and we take the reheater, and we take the 150 to 190 degree oil, and reheat that, that pipe on the reheater, and it goes up to 120. Now, <clears throat> What, when you reheat the pipe, the air in the pipe, you raise the pressure. And if it's a confined, there's nothing any, anywhere it can get away. So if you reheat it, what you're doing is you're putting more, the pressure in the pipe builds, which gives you more, more energy and more work in that. So those numbers in there, 170 out of the compressor, 100 degrees to the dryer, 70 from the dryer, and then 120 to the, to the pipe, you actually pick up about nine percent in pressure, which means you've got now. I now I, I've I've had not I have not changed my input energy one bit, not one bit, because it's just the same. For all, all we've done is heated it with free heat, that same free heat that, that wasn't used, and we pick up ten nine percent in pressure. So it does more work. 
That is driven by Charles's law. Charles's law says that at the constant, at constant pressure, <clears throat> the volume of the ideal gas varies directly as the absolute temperature. Now, in the case of Fahrenheit, absolute temperature, degree Fahrenheit, is also, you add 460 degree Rankin to the Fahrenheit number, and now it becomes uh, degrees Fahrenheit Rankin, or also called absolute Fahrenheit. It's another number if you're using centigrade. Charles's law says that a confined volume, in a confined volume, stored gas will increase in volume or pressure as the pressure directly proportional to the rise in temperature. So if you go up nine degrees, nine percent, then your pressure will go up nine percent, or your volume will go up nine percent. Either way, the volume is not going to go up since we're not letting it, since it's trapped in a confined space. The pressure is going to go up. In, exa in the example of the airline being reheated, which we just went through the numbers, it's about a 9% gain. Now, as you look deeper into heat recovery and what, how where can you find these heat recovery numbers, your, your imagination is only is unlimited. This is one some people don't understand, so they don't, they don't think about it. But there's other things that, that will come back into your wallet, put money back in your wallet without any, any major issues. Anything you can make, you can use the heat, hot air to change the, or change the results and not spend any money, you've gained. You gain. Okay, go ahead. So now let's take a part of, part of this is taken. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know what, you're not going to leave this going out how to do this exactly every time, every time, but these are the right guidelines. If we, we have basically three types of basic cooling, air-cooled air compressors. And, and it wouldn't be, when we talk about an air-cooled reciprocating compressor where the cylinders and the heads go into the room, you have to get out of it. If you, unless you're just, that's all you want to heat the room, you're not getting much. But when you talk about an air-cooled machine, like injected, cooled, lubricant cooled, injected, the heated compression is trapped in the air, air air to air heat exchanger and cooling system or an air to, wa air to water heat exchanger cooling system. Heat's available in the cooling air flows will dis and discharge cooling air and it, it's very effective and it, if you're not trying to run a dryer on it, it's fine. Okay, because you can't get to the numbers you need which we'll talk about later. Water-cooled air compressor is usually a com combination of water jacket cooling and and, and uh, uh, line line coolers, line flow flow through line coolers. Oil injected rotary screws. The injected cooling with cooling lubricants about 150 degrees. It's atomized in the compression chamber and it absorbs the heated compression while it's being generated. Generated. This generally holds a discharge temperature, but with controls to about 190 to 200, or you're going to get problems. And that's if you can build special machines, but with standard machines. So those those are the three things we got: air cooled compressor, air cooled heat exchangers, and and now. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so let's take a look at the understanding of heated compression air dryers. Why do they need oil-free air? HOC compressed air dryers require. 200 degree Fahrenheit or more inlet air temperature to deliver optimum performance and not have to use significant extra heating or purge controls. This, gen this discharge pressure is generally not consistently available with conventional lubricated rotary screw or any, 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 any lubricated machines. So the oil, because you, you, they got to go through an app, and they got generally go through an app screw. The oil carryover to a desiccant dryer is also somewhat harmful to the desiccant if, if you don't have it under control. And, and the new design, new machines are coming around every day now with this availability of continuous duty non lubricated compressors in much wider range, ranges and sizes 
such as centrifugals and non moving screw rotaries, offer a very solid foundation for long life oil free air systems. There is no other dryer technology. Okay, there is no other dryer technology with lower operating energy costs and inherent low maintenance costs than heated compression when operating conditions are correct. For most com commercial air plant air systems, the HOC is a viable choice when oil free compressed air is available. Now, this is kind of going back over things we've had in the past, just to bring it up to speed. All, most desiccant dryers operate with activated aluminum, alumina beads, as you see in this picture here. It can be a heated compression dryer, a blower purge dryer, and even a heatless dryer, which is heatless, there's always no heat whatsoever, and external heat dryer. All of these, they, except for the heatless dryer, increase the performance by adding some heat to make the transfer of the moisture from the from the air to the desiccant more efficient they all use the process of adsorption water vapor moves from the saturated compressed air to the surface of the deficit desiccant bead in their drying cycle and by the way they will not dry over 130 degree fahrenheit and they will not remove liquid water When you set up the moisture is trapped on the bead, the, uh, <clears throat> and I, so what you have to set up, the moisture gets trapped on the bead. When you go to the drying tower where you're or getting rid of the, I'm sorry, the regeneration tower, you gotta, you gotta surround that bead with a less, lower relative humidity so that the, so the water vapor can pass from the bead to the, what we call a purge air, in this case, well, it's the same thing. It's picking up the moisture, taking it out. So that's part of that is that you, you heat, you, you, you use some heat to reduce the relative humidity. There's another uh, little thing called fixed law of dispersion. When there's an imbalance in concentration, water vapor relative humidity, the vapor will always move from the high concentration level to the low concentration level to try to equalize, regardless of flow direction. The greater the imbalance, the faster the transfer. This is what drives the drying. Now, let's put a couple numbers on this. People say, well, we gotta have this temperature and that temperature. We gotta have 200 degrees. We gotta have 250. We brought it to have 350. So what does that mean? If you look at the amount of moisture that comes in it's probably somewhere, if you look at that left-hand column, you're going to see 800, cube, 800 cubic feet of air, 84 pounds. It would be about 88, 32 grains of cube, per cubic foot. And that's using some numbers of like 35 gra grains per, <clears throat> per cubic meter. Uh, 35 grains per cubic meter that are going to go into the, into the system. So if I if I use a 250 degrees, I end up with a 7.3 250 degree air. I end up with a 7.3 relative humidity going into the dryer, relatively dry. If I use 350 degrees, it's 3.2. So either way, it's it's a pretty low number. It's not as critical as you. I'm not saying it's not critical. But that it, these are all the things you calculate when you, when you want it to perform. What do you got? The, uh, the HOC dryer technology is basically the, the wet air comes into the, into the, regen, into the uh, regeneration tower. And, it's, and it's, it's wet, but it's hot. So it has low relative humidity, let's say 7%. It picks up the moisture off the beads runs it through the after cooler. The after cooler condenses the moisture, which come off, comes off as condensate, and it goes through the drying tower, just like any other drying tower, and out it goes to the system. Now, that, that's, that's basically how it works, unless you have to, uh, unless you want to get lower numbers with some other, you know, but if the number's okay, 
And what, what does this do? Go back, go back. There's a little comment here in, down in the left corner. In the most in most continental USA areas, a 200 degree Fahrenheit discharge temperature in a standard HOC without auxiliary heat can deliver a plus 40 to pressure dew point to a minus five pressure dew point with little or no operating costs. Now, think what that means. A refrigerator dryer gives you a plus 40. If you want to go to minus five, it doesn't. This dryer, well, basically, this type of dryer in a system, and you want to get, you want to go to minus 40 as your as your low number, or minus 10 as your low number, or minus five. It basically says it's energy free at minus five anywhere in this country, and it's going to be very low if it's not totally free because it operates in that band. That's that's the really sweet spot. There's a lot of a lot of systems that dry to minus 40 but don't need it. We did a we did a chemical plant that we were there we drying at minus 40 and we ended up cutting it back to about a minus five. And the, the bill went from something, and I forget what it was, hundred and some thousand dollars in savings to zero practically, because there was no energy cost when we, when we moved this. So if you have a system, there's a lot of places that have minus 40s, and they don't give you any. Uh, they don't necessarily even check to see if it is minus 40. So you need to look at it. If you don't need it, don't pay for it. Now here's here's another. This is a, a two looks at a heated compression system and a standard system. The top system here, the compressor goes to the after cooler, cools all the air down to less than 100 degrees, goes to the dryer and whatever kind of dryer it is, but it's, whether it's a dryer, uh, external purge or whatever it is, it's there, whatever it's going to work. The heated compression goes goes to the goes to the dryer and if it doesn't need to go anywhere else that's where it goes and then it goes from the dryer to the after cooler and then into the system if you need something else then you may have to it may have to go to the heaters but it always the heated compression always goes directly to the dryer first and a conventional goes to the so put it in a summary heated compression dryer hot air discharges from the oil-free air compressor enters the dryer at a very low relative humidity where it picks up the water vapor. The hot, wet air then goes to the aftercooler where the temperature is reduced and moisture from the cool after cool air then enters the drying tower where the remaining moisture is removed from the air. After the cycle is completed, the tower is switched and the process is repeated. No lost purge air. That is a major, major, can be a major thing. And then there are controls that can do whatever you want to do with them anyway. Anyway, this is where we turn the presentation over to the most knowledgeable men and one of the most knowledgeable men in the country on heat, heat of compression dryers, Mr. Chuck Henderson of Henderson Engineering. Chuck and his team have taught me more about desiccant dryers than any group I've ever worked with. I hope our presentation has taken some of the mystery out of heat of compression, helped them clarify the technology for you. And uh, we thank you very much for. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Van Ormer. I want to remind everybody that if you have um, questions to plea, you can send them out and you can submit them now in your questions box. We will have that Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Our next speaker is Chuck Henderson. Mr. Henderson is the Vice President of Henderson Engineering Company and has over 40 years of experience in the compressor industry. Take it away, Chuck. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Hank. I appreciate it. That was a great presentation. Uh, let's see. And are you going to switch to the next slide? There we go. Okay, so we want to talk about energy efficiency and uh, operating in a global economy. The future belongs to the efficient. So when we talk about heat recovery, utilizing heat of compression drying technology is one of the best ways to improve operating efficiency and save money. 
So heat compression technology is, again, one of the fastest ways to manage a heat recovery project. You can save tremendous amounts of money. To get the greatest benefit of heat recovery, all of the heat of compression should be used. So when we regenerate, we want to regenerate at full flow. We want to use all the heat, all the energy, all the BTUs directly from the final stage of compression. We're going to put that hot air into the regenerating tower and put that heat to work. There's no point in heating all of the air and then only using some of it to regenerate. By using full flow regeneration, the dryer is able to deliver dew point under a variety of conditions. You can operate at low load, partial load. So heat is wasted if valves leak. The selection of components is critical. Your switching valves have to be high performance bubble tight. If you have a valve leak on a heatless dryer, a blower burst dryer, a, a standard regenerative dryer, it's not the end of the world. In fact, sometimes an air leak makes the dryer work better. With heat of compression, an air leak gives you wet air coming out of the dryer. So it's critical that your components function properly. So all your switching valves have to be absolutely leak tight. There's basically two factors with any mechanical equipment. You know, your basic design and your choice of components. So basic design for heated compression, again, regeneration has to be full flow. If you're doing partial flow and the compressor is lightly loaded, you're just not getting enough BTUs, enough heat into the regenerating tower to regenerate the desiccant. If you think of the desiccant as a sponge, during the drying process, you let the sponge up, right? It fills up with water. During regeneration, you squeeze water out of the sponge. If you have full flow, you got a lot of force to squeeze that water out. At partial flow regeneration, much less force, particularly if the compressor is lightly loaded. Now we want to cool our desiccant bed before you switch towers. This is going to give you the lowest dew point. The problem is if you cool it with wet air, you're going to preload the desk in which increases your dew point. If you have a low temperature compressor, if it's 200 degrees Fahrenheit or less, and you put a heater at the inlet to increase the temperature, well, that's going to consume a lot of energy, and a heater at the inlet is going to increase pressure drop. There are ways of putting supplemental heat in the dryer, and you don't have to heat all the air. Some heat of compression designs use multiple aftercoolers, but multiple heat exchangers is more cooling water and more chance for failure. The more components you have, the more things that can go wrong. So two aftercoolers, two separators, two drain trap systems, you want to try to keep it simple. So your choice of components is critical. Valves have to be high performance, bubble tight. Leakage across the valve means you get high dew points. There are some heated compression designs that I see um, the dryer manufacturer uses multi-port valves, three-way or four-way plug valves. Those valves inherently leak and should never be used in heated compression applications. One of the most critical components on the dryer is your drain trap. That's physically where the water is removed. So if your drain trap fails, where does the water go? Well, obviously, it stays in the system, it's just like a refrigerator dryer. You've got the refrigerator dryer humming along, and you look at the drain trap, and if you don't see any water coming out of it, where's the water? Separators have to be efficient at zero to 100% flow. There are different uh, separator designs. Cyclone and centrifugal separators are flow dependent. Coalescing separators, just like a coalescing filter, are not flow dependent and provide the best uh, moisture removal efficiency. When you size a heat compression dryer, there's a few factors that you have to consider. First is the minimum discharge temperature from the compressor. This is the air coming off the final stage. So if it's a rotary screw, typically that's going to be two stage. If it's a centrifugal, it could be two, three, or four. So we're going to measure the air temperature at the discharge of the final stage before it goes into the after cooler. Right, what's your maximum flow rate? What's your maximum cooling water temperature? Most machines tend to be uh, water cooled. Heated compression dryers, of course, can be air cooled, just like compressors can be air cooled. If you're using an air cooled machine, you have to be aware of the efficiency of the heat exchanger and the ambient temperatures. If you put an air cooled machine in the desert, it's going to get a very high discharge temperature coming out of the heat exchanger, and that's going to put a high water load on the dryer. 
air has a varying capacity to hold water. The hotter it is, the more water can hold. A good rule of thumb is every 20 degree increase in temperature doubles the air's capacity to hold moisture. So the temperature of the air that we're drying is critical. If you design a dryer to dry 80 degrees and instead you come in at 100, well, that's twice as much water. So the dryer obviously isn't going to work. So your maximum cooling water temperature or ambient air temperature for air cooled is critical. We also size our dryers based on minimum inlet pressure. Um, that has to do with velocity, uh, contact time. You know, a lot of times a compressor guy might say we have a 125 pound air compressor. That's great, that's the maximum discharge, but we always want to design the dryer based on the minimum. So if you come in at 80 pounds instead of 125, that's about a 30% uh, sizing implication. So we always size for the maximum flow rate, the minimum regeneration temperature, maximum drying temperature, minimum pressure. Now we've got a variety of case studies. There's thousands of heat of compression dryers operating around the world. This is an installation at General Motors where we have four centrifugal compressors. Each one is 7,500 CFM. See the top unit is ready, second unit's ready. The third unit here is loaded. It's actually pumping air. And then the bottom here is also ready. So they got four compressors manifolded into a common header going into three 8,500 CFM dryers. So out of the discharge header, you see the flow rate is roughly 7,500 CFM. And each of these dryers, again, is 8,500 CFM. So it's less than a third load. And you can see you're getting a dew point of minus 58, minus 53, minus 56. So it is possible to get very good dew points at less than full load. One of the myths with heat compression is you need 350 degrees Fahrenheit to regenerate. Here's a screenshot of the control. We see the inlet temperature of the dryer is 234 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're getting minus 57 dew points. So it is possible to get very low dew points without 350 degree regeneration. And we like to see 200 at a minimum, 225 is better, 250 is even better, but you don't need 350. Now, when we talk about dew points and dew point spikes, there's really no such thing as a completely flatline dew point. This chart actually illustrates what we consider to be flatline. The dryer is delivering better than minus 60, and the dew point control instrument is set to switch towers at minus 40. So over time, the dew point rises to minus 40. It hits the customer selected switch point. We switch towers, then the dew point drops. This dryer operates on an eight hour time cycle. It's four hours per tower. So you've got your normal four hour time and our dew point is still well below our switch point. So now we go into standby, in which case you're simply drying air. There is no energy being consumed. And of course, with heat of compression, it's essentially energy free anyway, but we're extending the time cycle so we're not switching towers as often. This reduces wear and tear on all of your components. After another four hours or so, we get up to our minus 40 switch point. We switch towers and the dew point drops. So there's always little peaks and valley waves at the dew point, but you never go above your switch point. One of the keys to success with heat of compression is operating cost savings. You know, I like to think of reliability as being more important than operating cost, actually, but when it gets everybody excited is cost savings. So here's a system of 4,000 CFM, 100 pounds, 100 degrees. It's going to operate 24-7. And we're using 5 cents a kilowatt for electricity. So a heatless dryer would cost you $83,000 a year to operate. So fair amount of money. Externally heated, 46,000. A blower perch dryer, either 41 or 33, depending on if you perch or not. Heat compression with a full trim heater, getting flat line minus 40 all year round is 5,000. So you immediately see the savings. If you can live with varying dew points and dew point fluctuations, um, you can get a heat of compression dryer that gets you zero to minus 40, and it's 40 bucks a year. It's an operating cost of a light bulb. That's 
even cheaper than a refrigerator dryer. A refrigerator dryer is almost $10,000 a year for a plus 42 point. So operating cost savings are dramatic with heat of compression. So why is heat of compression popular? Well, virtually no operating cost. It is inherently more reliable than other types of dryers because you don't have heaters, you don't have blowers, um, you're not switching every five minutes like a heatless dryer. So fewer components means fewer chance of failure and guaranteed performance. With the right operating conditions, you can get exception and low dew points. And you can see um, dew points, we have customers well below minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit pressure dew points with heat of compression dryers. So a lot of opportunities for tremendous savings. Here's one installation in Brazil at a Petro Chem company. There's 14 10,000 CFM units and a couple small ones in the background. So thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about heat of compression dryers and energy savings. Okay, thank you very much, Chuck. Now we will uh, transition to the Q&A section of the webinar. Uh, we have roughly 10 minutes, so we'll try to be as efficient as pos possible in answering the questions. If you would like additional details on a particular topic, please submit these as well in the questions window, and we can reach out following the webinars. I remind you to stay tuned after the Q&A session as we will have a contest for a chance for you to win a free full conference pass to our show. Okay, our first question is for Mr. Van Ormer, and it comes from a steel company in Indiana. And the question is, what is the water content of saturated and dry desiccant? Uh, I'm gonna. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Uh, I'm gonna, let me ask Chuck if he has a, a specific. I can't give you a specific answer. I don't know whether it would. Chuck, to ask you, is there a number you okay. can put on? Okay, so water um, holding content, I'm thinking they're requesting. So brand new desiccant is roughly 25% activated alumina. So that means four pounds of alumina will hold one pound of water. And then as um, the desiccant ages over time, it's going to lose capacity. Desiccant loses capacity. The, the worst cause is contamination, oil contamination or chemical contamination. There are chemicals, chlorine, fluorine, that will damage the desiccant. Um, the desiccant loses capacity due to thermal shock. Every time you heat it up and cool it down, there's a slight loss. Um, pressure shock, every time you pressurize and depressurize, there's a slight loss. Typically, desiccant's going to last you five years. In oil-free systems, um, 10 years. Okay, thank you. This next question is for Mr. Henderson, and it comes from a distributor in Michigan. And their question is, with heat of compression dryers, do you use do you see a dew point spike during the tower shifting? There can, yeah. There's, we actually make two different designs. Um, the very simple one does have a dew point spike at tower shift. The little more complicated one does not. A dew point spike is an interesting phenomenon. It's common with most every heated dryer. It's not unique to heat of compression. So if you have an exhaust purge, blower purge, odds are pretty good you see a dew point spike. Now, dew point spikes, a phenomenon you notice right at the dryer discharge as the air moves out through the plant and through the piping system, it all tends to blend and homogenize so that downstream you have a very low average dew point. So if dew point spikes are a concern, there are heat of compression designs that can deliver flatline dew point, like the, the slide I showed you where we never exceeded minus 40. Okay, thank you. This um, next question is for Mr. Van Ormer. And the question is, does the water come off just from venting? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, does the water come off just from venting? Does the water come off just from venting? I don't understand the question. 
Well, there's two of them. Right, well, I don't I'm, know that too, You've got moisture coming out of the separator on the aftercooler. As the hot air goes into the aftercooler and cools down, liquid water is condensed and removed in the separator and traps. If you have a heat of compression dryer with purge, a stripping cycle, then additional water comes out with the purge. Okay, thank you. This next question is for Mr. Henderson. The question is, why use activated alumina as a desiccant rather than silica gel? Because alumina gives you better performance, basically. Silica gel has a slightly higher adsorptive capacity, but require the, the really good gel is about 30% instead of 25. But if it comes in contact with liquid water, it becomes popcorn. It turns to sand. So you need to protect the active gel with a layer of inactive desiccant. So you force the customer to put one kind of desiccant in first and then the other after it, and it becomes a little more complicated. With activated alumina, you're just pouring one bag in, and it does the job. It's less expensive than gel, gets you the same dew point, lasts longer. Um, so. I don't know of very many dryer manufacturers that use silica gel as a standard desiccant for any regenerative dryer at this time. Just about everybody is uh, standardized in activated alumina. Okay, thank you. This next question is for Mr. Van Ormer. The question is, do all heat of compression projects require oil-free air? Oh, uh, if, if it's a dryer, Probably yeah, the best selection is all for air, and pretty much the only selection. But if you're just going to heat a heat a, heat an area, heat a process, heat some water up, it doesn't have to be all free. Okay, thank you. Um, we had someone submit two questions at the same time, both for um, Mr. Henderson. Uh, the first question was, what was the flow rate of the large system in the last picture from your presentation? And then secondly, if you need it, where should the auxiliary heater be located in the dryer? Yeah, um, that was a Petrobras in Recife, Brazil. It's uh, beautiful right on the coast of Brazil. There were 14 10,000 CFM heat of compression dryers with centrifugal compressors and two uh, five thousandths, I believe. So a, a total of 16 dryers. And um, let's see, what was the second question again? I'm sorry. The second, the second question was, um, where should the auxiliary heater be located in the dryer? Yeah. Okay, so we make a heater compression design, we call it the HC which has a, a stripping cycle. And what that does is it allows the dry purge air, just like on a heatless dryer, to remove more moisture from the desk and in the regenerating tower. So if we need to add supplemental heat, we're going to put the heater in the stripping line. Essentially, it allows the heater compression dryer to operate as an externally heated. So we're going to heat a small amount of purge air and allow that hot purge air to remove the residual moisture from the deskin. Again, if you think of deskin as a sponge, heat of compression is going to squeeze the bulk of the water out of that sponge. And then if we need additional heat to give you lower dew points, we're gonna add that supplemental heat to squeeze more water. The more water you squeeze out of the sponge, the more water it can hold during drying and the lower dew points it can give you. Okay, thank you. Um, that takes us to the end of our allotted time. All questions will be followed up with via email following our session. We now invite you to play for a chance to win a free full conference pass to the 2019 Best Practices Expo and Conference. This is a $675 value. Um, this contest is open to those who have a direct impact on the energy savings within a factory, including factory personnel, compressed air distributors, utility incentive programs, and engineering firms. Exhibiting and sponsor companies are not qualified to, to participate. A winner will be randomly selected from those who submit correct answers and notified tomorrow via email and phone. 
Below on this slide is a sample question with clues that provide just the first letter of the answers. So the sample question is, when I think of a beach vacation, I think of blank. And then I'm gonna load the, and then the answers that are loaded, um, as you see, um, the clues had the, just the first letter of the word, but um, then the answers were Tau, Tiki Bar, and Seashells. Okay, so this next slide um, shows a statement related to today's topic that needs to be filled in. Um, you are provided the first letter of the words as a clue. Um, please submit your answers in the questions um, in the questions window. And here's the statement that needs to be filled in based on the clues below. When I think of heat of compression desiccant and dryers, I think of blank. All the clues are two words. The first clue has two words beginning with H and R. The second clue down here has two words beginning with D and P. And the last clue has two words beginning with R and H. You have one minute to submit your answers. Good luck. Um, remember, uh, this contest is open to factory personnel, compressed air distributors, utility incentive programs, and engineering firms. Um, this free full conference pass um, like I said, it's a $675 value, um, and it'll give you access to two and a half days of conference sessions, opening and plenary sessions, the expo hall, receptions, and plenty of networking opportunities. And as I said, we will be randomly selecting the winner from those who submitted correct answers, and we'll notify them tomorrow via email and phone. And just a reminder to everybody, the 2019 Best Practices Expo and Conference will be at the Music City Center in Nashville, Tennessee, on October 13th through the 16th. Our show is focusing on optimizing on-site utilities, powering automation, and by attending, you will get to hear from speakers representing General Mills, Ball Packaging, Compressed Air and Gas Institute, Compressed Air Challenge, Nissan North America, Eastman, and many more. Okay, um, just a few more moments to get those answers in. Um, the statement is, when I think of heat of compression desiccant dryers, I think of blank. Okay, so just a couple more minutes here. We've got a lot of answers coming in. Um, so, okay, I'm still coming in here. All right, and as I said, um, you the winner will be announced tomorrow. We will uh, be emailing and phoning folks. Okay, um, we are now running out of time here. I am going to reveal the answers. The correct answers were heat recovery, dew point, and relative humidity. Thank you to everyone who participated in the contest. I think, want to thank everyone again today for joining us, and I'd like to encourage you to take the brief survey as you leave the session. Our slides and recording of this webinar will be made available via email later today. Also, PDH certificates will be emailed within two days. Please join us again on June 6 at 2 p.m., selecting and sizing oil-free air compressors. Our keynote speaker is Tom Torano, owner of Data Power Services. This webinar is sponsored by Atlas Copco Compressors and NIDAC Motor Corporation. Free registration is available on our website at airbestpractices.com slash magazine slash webinars. Thank you. I hope everyone has a great rest of the afternoon.